I'm excited to have our guest speakers today. So let me start with some introductions. My name is Felicia Campbell. We also have with us Kim Bullivant. Um, we are both marketing managers for the CoStars program. And we also have our guest speakers who are experts in green procurement um, and, and just green in general. Mark Hand and Heidi Kunka are with us today. Um, in a few moments, I'll talk more about their vast experience that they have um, within the topic today. Um, but first, I want to discuss DGS's commitment to green procurement. And I'm going to go off camera while we start the presentation officially. In recent years, many organizations throughout the Commonwealth have developed um, green initiatives to advance the protection of our environment and support sustainability for future generations. In the same manner, the Department of General Services Bureau of Procurement makes environmentally preferable procurement one of its predominant goals. Environmentally pref uh, preferable procurement, which we also refer to as EPP or green procurement, is the selection of products and services that have a lesser or reduced impact on the environment over the life cycle of the product or service when compared with competing products or services serving the same purpose. When selecting green products, the Bureau of Procurement takes into consideration many factors, including the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and air contaminants, reduced waste, and reduced hazardous waste and toxic and hazardous substances. Stop for a minute and mute some participants. And hopefully not myself. We also consider factors such as improved energy and water efficiency and supportive reuse and recycling and use of renewable resources. DGS's policy is to analyze each commodity and service during the bid process to determine what EPP options are available. The green option is utilized whenever the product or service is comparable in quality, availability, and price. In today's session, we'll explore the importance of green procurement and we'll learn about product certifications, the Green Gov Council, and Local Climate Action Program, which is also known as LCAP, um, and find the green contracts for your procurement. Oops, one moment. Um, before I introduce today's guest speakers, I do want to mention that if you're not currently a CoStars member, we will discuss later in the presentation how you can learn the simple and free process of becoming a member of the program to make your overall procurement more efficient and effective. So stay tuned for that information. Today we invited two Commonwealth employees who are far from green on the topic of green. Mark Hand serves as the director of Pennsylvania's Green Gov Council within the, de the Department of General Services. The Green Gov Council was established by the direction of Governor Wolf's Executive Order EO 2019-01 on Commonwealth leadership in addressing climate change and promoting energy conservation and sustainable governance. The mission of GreenGov is to incorporate sustainable practices into Commonwealth government's policy, planning, operations, procurement, and regulatory functions, and to strive for continuous improvement in efficiency and performance. The executive order has a specific focus on reducing energy consumption, purchasing electric vehicles and renewable energy, and constructing new buildings and major renovations to green standards. Prior to Green Gov, Mark worked for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection for almost 19 years. He spent most of his time at DEP with the Energy Programs Office, which is involved in supporting, designing, and implementing energy-focused programs to encourage the development and deployment of energy efficiency and alternative energy products in Pennsylvania. In that time, Mark worked on various programs and initiatives for DEP, such as Drive Electric PA Coalition, the Alternative Fuels Incentive Grant Program, Pennsylvania Emergency, or sorry, Energy Development Authority Grants, and many others over those years. Um, and I want to introduce Heidi as well, though Mark will be the first one speaking. Uh, Heidi Kunko works with the Department of um, Environmental Protection's Energy Programs Office, where she assists in managing all aspects of the Pennsylvania Climate Change Act, including the PA Climate Impacts Assessment, 
Climate Action Plan, Annual Greenhouse Gas Inventory, and Climate Change Advisory Council. She developed and manages DEP's local climate action program in which college students and local government teams are trained to develop greenhouse gas inventories and climate action plans. Heidi also supports the PA Green Gov Council and DEP on developing sustainability strategies. She is a certified climate change professional. Um, Heidi, how do you say this? Is it LEAD or L-E-E-D? LEAD AP, LEAD Accredited Professional. Thank you. And she's earned a um, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science as well as a Master's in Environmental Pollution Control. So as you can see, there is a lot of experience here with our two guest speakers. So we're excited to have them both share their insights on everything green. So good morning to you both. And Mark, I would like to start with you. Can you start by telling us a little bit more about the Green Gov Council and what you're doing there? Sure, yeah. Felicia, thanks for the introduction and inviting us today for uh, this webinar. I'm looking forward to it. Me um, too. Yeah, let me um, share my screen here and um, get started. Just bear with me for one second. So yeah, um, so I am the director of the of the Pennsylvania Green Gov Council. Um, let me put this in slide mode. And um, I just so we were established under, like as you said in the introduction, the governor's uh, executive order 2019-01, and it set um, ambitious climate goals for Pennsylvania: 26% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2025, and an 80% reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And this this is a goal for the entire state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's the first climate goal um, on record for Pennsylvania, and I'm happy to be a part of this this program. Um, so we are co-chaired by the Department of General Services, the secretaries of the Department of General Services, Department of Environmental Protection, and Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and they uh, we meet uh, bi biweekly and um, have very um, good dialogue with the secretaries to try to advance the program and advance sustainability in the Commonwealth. So other than the large goal, which is a lead by example, uh, a large goal for the Commonwealth, we have lead by example goals for Commonwealth agencies that are written into this executive order. And, um, you know, as you can see here, you know, they're not, uh, each goal is, is very unique. We have a 3% reduction in energy consumption. We have a, a passenger fleet goal to convert vehicles to electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. Uh, we're looking to procure 40, at least 40% of our renewable elect, uh, electricity from renewable sources. And then we also want to build high-performance green buildings. And nowhere does it say that one of our goals is environmentally preferred purchasing, but it's really um, embedded into most, if not all of these goals for sure, um, for you know, procuring vehicles, procuring renewable electricity and, and buildings standards. So procurement is, is environmentally preferred purchasing and procurement is, is very important to meeting our goals and, and our lead by example strategies. So how do we measure and account for um, the governor's executive order, and how do we support it? And I'm just going to touch base, I'll touch a little bit, of, a few points here, and then we'll move into some products and materials. So, one of the things for those that may not be familiar with our program is we have um, published uh, an annual report now two years in a row, a 2019 and 2020 annual report, and it's has a lot of um, benchmarking and analysis in it, and it's it's a, a an executive report that you can kind of get a, a, a feel for um, how the Commonwealth agencies are progressing on sustainability. Um, we'd like to think of it as the report on record for sustainability initiatives, initiatives and actions in the Commonwealth, um, and that's what we're really striving to for transparency for so the public can uh, view um, how we are making progress on our goals. We also have um, a GreenGov newsletter, and our first one was uh, 
sent out in the spring of 2021. It high, it's another way that we're looking to highlight agencies' efforts to meeting the sustainability goals. Other things that we're working on is um, we have um, public meetings twice a year. And if you are in the audience and you want to participate in our public meetings, please just send us a send me an email and we'll happily um, invite you to um, our next meeting and look we look forward to your participation in it. Uh, the other thing we have is an educational series on various sustainability topics. We've now done this uh, two years in a row in the fall of last year and in the spring of spring summer of this year where we partnered with Penn State Sustainability Institute to put on a webinar series on various sustainability topics. And then one of the other major thrusts of our program is this GreenGov Agency Certification Checklist. Uh, we developed this when we started in middle of 2019. Agencies, um, 30 agencies of the Commonwealth uh, are required to report on this checklist. It's basically an assessment tool. It gauges agencies uh, level um, from one year to the next on where they are with sustainability measures. There's a number of categories that I'm not going to get into in in great detail here, but a lot of the items in our checklist really is for is is geared towards uh, agency evaluation. But if you're coming from a local government, there are certainly um, energy strategies, procurement strategies in here that. Um, I would just encourage you to look at and you know see if there's items in there that you could adopt for your your local government or your your jurisdiction. I think it's it's worth taking a look at. And also it's on our website so you can see how uh, thirty the thirty agencies that have submitted these have um, scored from one year to the next. So and then finally, another way we sort of, track this program and try to enhance our program on sustainability is we have focus groups with agencies. So each of these uh, blocks represents a focus group area that we determined early on was really necessary to move the bar on on our initiatives and lead by example. And so this is these are closed focus groups for agencies, but my point here is that you can see that we have six primary focus groups that meet quarterly and uh, products and materials is one of those six. It's extremely important um, in that products and materials focus group. We talk a lot about recycling. We're planning to, to do um, recycling tours of facilities that are um, best practices so that we can enhance our recycling. But the other piece to it is we are working together as a team to, tr to work to enhance our environmentally preferred purchasing um, options in the Commonwealth. So I am, you know, I'm thrilled that we we're invited to this presentation because I, I guess, you know, after we got the program established and, you know, just looking back, I mean, procurement is basically one of the primary vehicles to lead by example and sort of and this partnership or this future partnership with CoStars and options that we can help to enhance CoStars, I think is is a really a good primary tool that we can as agencies um, help local government and other jurisdictions. So just wanted to touch base a little bit about why environmentally preferred purchasing is important. And just in case folks aren't aware, uh, the products, you know, we, we buy products all the time and they have impacts across the entire supply chain, but it's really too difficult for us as purchasers to dig in and understand whether there's impacts to extraction, manufacturing, packaging, distribution, retail, all these different items. And some of, you know, each logo has a different take on, on what they're looking for, but they're all independent third party certifications. Um, you know, and they look at different attributes of the supply chain on the product, so you don't have to. I mean, that's really why you want to shop for a logo, why you want to support a logo. Um, environmentally preferred purchasing can address uh, anything from climate, air, water, pollution, toxic exposures, 
resource use, ecosystem damages and disposal. And the other major piece to it is that, you know, EPP helps with U.S. industry competitiveness where, you know, maybe in, in other countries they don't have the environmental standards and they can sort of undercut costs. Uh, some of these logos can help support our local uh, manufacturing in, in the United States. And I also wanted to say just it's EPP is really super important to to Department of General Services and Pennsylvania agencies in um, in fiscal year 2019 and 20 through 2020. We purchased about 138 million uh, dollars worth of purchases of EPP products and um, that was up from fiscal year 1819 of 50 about 57 million dollars of products. So we are a very large purchaser of EPP and um, I just have this this graphic here and the, the source I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention that um, obviously the EPA has on their website recommendations and specification standards for federal purchasing and so you can kind of if you're not sure what logos to be looking for necessarily there's a, there's definitely federal reference materials on what um, federal agencies are are tasked to to use as standards because there are lots and lots of labels so this is a good starting point to look to look at and then one of the um the big things that pennsylvania has done in the past two years is we um supported the electronic product environmental assessment tool epeat which is one of the labels that i wanted to talk about today um, it's it's a global eco label for the it sector it includes computers television servers and phones and um you know epeat the standard itself the third party certification looks at most of the supply chain from material selection through uh, end of life and also the corporate performance is important um, to EP. So they have their their rating system and um, DGS has won EP awards with uh, other state agencies and um, municipalities across the country two years in a row. We just with EP alone um, in 2020, we purchased over 67,000 products that that meet the EP criteria. And the EP estimated that the cost savings was over $1.3 million. And so this is kind of hot off the press because uh, there's an award ceremony that DGS is going to participate in. It's scheduled for July 28th. And, um, you know, this will be our second award, and I'm proud of the, the work that they've done. So, another eco label. Um, and EPP is what, what we use for um, meeting our renewable electricity requirements in the Commonwealth, that 40% goal um, over the last two years and the upcoming year is Green E certified. We use this, this criteria to, to meet that, that, um, that executive order goal set by the governor. And so what it is, is the third party certification of, and you basically are securing the renewable energy certificates of projects that go in really anywhere in the United States. They have to be new projects. And um, there's a really tight, um, the, the Green E staff, and there's a really tight control to make sure that there's no double counting. So if you buy Green E certificates, you are buying the, um, the renewable energy attributes of those solar um, arrays or wind arrays or windmills or whatever the criteria, whatever the renewable energy is, um, and it's it's guaranteed that you are buying that product. So it's it's a really good third party system to meet corporate goals or local government goals. Um, and so there is an energy supply and management ITQ in the Bureau of Procurement that where we um, shopped for the Green E certif cert certificates, excuse me. And so we had purchased over 308,000 renewable energy credits at a cost of $228,000. And 
and that was offsetting and meeting the governor's goal of 40 percent and it seems like a, a lot but uh, we um, it really is not if you consider um, the you know offsetting basically it's representing 40 percent of our electricity that's that's clean energy for that for that cost and then also there's been the Bureau of Procurement did a lot of really great uh, shopping for um, electricity to basically use the, the savings from their shopping over the years to to buy the renewable energy credits through the Greeny certified program. So and then you can see the, um, the carbon offset from from that example. And then so I guess Pennsylvania is going one step further and I don't know if, if you've all heard of Pennsylvania Pulse. It was just announced this spring and it's we basically set up a, um, a contract, another contract to buy uh, renewable energy um, through a generation supply. And so it's it's another ITQ that's available. It's not available for local governments and I can explain why in a minute, but essentially what we're shifting to here is our renewable energy credit purchases were US wide and now with this new model we're using, we're going to support six large solar arrays in central Pennsylvania. So really, you know, the um, the, ener the uh, climate benefits are the same, whether they're generated um, in the Midwest renewable energy or in Pennsylvania, but what we have done here is um, created uh, local uh, revenues and business. Um, so so that's a, a great project uh, for us that will kick in. It'll be built and started to be constructed in 2022, and then it'll come online in 2023. And um, it's very large. And but unfortunately, at this point, local governments we haven't figured out a mechanism for local governments to use it because you really need to aggregate a lot of uh, electricity load. And so you need basically multiple local governments that agree legally agree and are are bound by contractual relations to buy generation together um, as a joint purchase. So there's a, there's more details that need to be worked out, but I just wanted to to bring this to your attention that it might be a future opportunity um, working through logistics but for right now that please do take a look at the green e certified it's it's a great program and then um, i just wanted to highlight energy star i think everyone knows about energy star um, i when i worked for dep i was the energy star coordinator for a few years and i'm i'm particularly fond of this program it is not um it's a government backed symbol for energy efficiency and it's supported by the US EPA and the US Department of Energy and it's been around forever seemingly since 1992. And um, it's really just looking at energy efficiency. So earlier I had said that EPP labels and eco, eco labels can look at different parts of the supply chain. Energy Star is just looking at the efficiency of the product. So it's not looking at how something's manufactured and, and so on and so forth, but it's been so successful over the years. Um, it, there, the US EPA and DOE has, you know, part, significant partnerships with manufacturers. Obviously your utility companies um, rely heavily on Energy Star to um, market to the public. Um, it's you know, it's intended to be a standard of 15% better than than like an average appliance in the category. So it's an incremental efficiency standard, but one of the things that it does is because the, all the manufacturers have, many of the manufacturers have bought into the program over the years, they create, they manufacture products that meet the, the criteria. And in doing so, I, I kind of feel like it also brings up the bottom too. So um, there's less of the minimum federal efficiency standard uh, appliances out there and there's more willingness to um, increase the minimum federal federal standards over time because Energy Star kind of marches the bar up over time. So it's definitely whenever you buy an energy consuming product, it's 
definitely worth looking at a minimum at Energy Star for sure. There's uh, products in ev every sort of energy consuming category you can think of. And if you haven't, if you're not aware, there's also, um, you can also have an Energy Star home, which I have one. Um, and then there's also Energy Star commercial building. So you can get your building rated to show that it's one of the top performing buildings in the country. So while this is not a, an eco label per se, um, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, as part of our lead by example goals, we're trying to convert our passenger fleet to electric vehicles and plug in hybrids. And our DGS Bureau of Vehicle Management um, in this past year added nine additional um, high efficiency vehicles to the state contract. And there's there's actually work underway to do a lot more and expand this um, significantly. And I'm looking forward to what this next year brings and how I'm hoping this list can, you know, potentially double. And um, hopefully this these criteria. While you guys, while uh, CoStars has a different green contract, this is sort of our statewide list. Um, hopefully that uh, procurement mechanism through Bureau of Vehicle Management will add significantly to your CoStars green card list as well. And then um, I think this is finally um, just some other things that we're doing with Bureau of Procurement and and through purchasing. We have an electric vehicle supply equipment contract available, and this is not for, um, it's for electric vehicle charging equipment. It's not for construction of the equipment, so running lines, electric lines, and trenching, and anything like that. Um, because you can't do construction through, um, through procurement. Uh, so what this is, is if you were, if you have a project that you know, you, you can, it doesn't require construction or you can wrap the, cons the constructions wrapped up in another project, you can use this contract to uh, find the best, the best uh, electric vehicle supply equipment that you can get for your, for your situation. And you can use that, uh, those, those vendors on contract to help you sort through the, the myriad of, um, equipment options that are out there and if you're looking at network charging you can also um, basically use that contract to get into a, a network charge situation for a cup for multiple years and then just a couple other things is um, i'm working on um, an ashray level one and level two energy audit through itq and what this is is um, it's basically a walkthrough building audit where you, where an ASHRAE level one is a very simple audit that looks for sort of low hanging fruit, things with uh, simple paybacks and opportunities for you to invest in your facility. And then a, a level two audit's just a little bit deeper and wider where you're there, um, the auditor digs in a little bit more and um, to, to your situation to find more uh, deeper opportunities for for more retrofits of your facility. And I'm actually, the reason why we developed this is because um, as lead by example, we're working with um, our Bureau of Real Estate who manages our lease portfolio, which is um, you know, about half of our portfolio of buildings in the state. And so one of the things we're working to, to do is to sort of incorporate an energy audit into our lease, our lease language in the future. So this ITQ is going to help agencies and uh, our lessors to um, sort of get that get that kicked off and hopefully you all can use it as well um, in your situations. And then just to add one more piece is um, we're adding an Energy Star building certification um, under that same under the a similar ITQ where and we, we, I mentioned it earlier, the Energy Star, you can get Energy Star labeled buildings and you have for many, many years. And so we want to set up an ITQ to, for, um, to get contractors on board who can walk through your facility and uh, help you apply for the label for Energy Star because you need a third party 
um, engineer or architect to stamp the, to say that the building is efficient and that it meets uh, EPA standards for for energy efficiency. So, with that said, um, I just wanted to thank you all for for your time and just you have my um my website and my contact information here and I will un stop sharing here and turn it back over uh, once I figure out how to end the slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you just hit the same. There you yep, go. Got it. Cool. Well, Back thank you, you, Mark. Um, that was really insightful. And from my role with CoStars, I know about the Green Gov Council, but I wasn't quite aware of just how much the council has been doing to increase the Commonwealth's reach for more green and sustainable procurement. So that was great information to have. And I know that you talked about um, some specific contracts. But just to let our attendees know, we are going to have uh, Kim Bullivant's going to go over, um, highlight many of our uh, uh, contracts that will also fit within this green spectrum. So um, stay tuned for that information. But before we do that, I want to bring Heidi into the conversation. Heidi, I know Mark spoke about EP, the Greeny Certified and Energy Star, but can you explain to us about some other green certifications? What do they mean and how do those certifications um, help our communities when we focus on them for our procurement strategies? Sure thing, Felicia. Um, so uh, thanks for having me today. Again, I'm Heidi. I'm with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection in our Energy Programs Office. And I just wanted to uh, sort of continue the little list of um, green or eco labels that uh, Mark had been sharing with you so that when you look at the green contracts that that DGS office offers, um, you can recognize some of these uh, additional labels. Uh, Mark and I sort of went through the various um, green labels that um, DGS has in some of their contracts and we, we picked out our favorites. So I'm going to continue um, sharing some of our favorites that have been around for uh, many years. We can see your slides now. I think you're muted, Heidi. Oh, I was. Sorry about that. Um, so, these are two uh, labels that you will see on um, a variety of project uh, pro products, uh, copier paper, you'll see it on toilet paper, tissue paper, um, paper towels, also um, flooring, uh, wood flooring products as well. And so FSC stands for Forest Stewardship Council, and then there's SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Um, FSC is considered the more stringent label. If you really want to uh, go for the gusto and, and make a difference, FSC is seen as more stringent. They are a nonprofit organization. Sustainable Forestry Initiative was started by the pulp and paper industry for the pulp and paper industry. Um, it's a trade organization, but that doesn't mean it, it's not great. Um, it, it is great to see the pulp and paper industry trying to create their own certification um, system to ensure that there are sustainably managed forests. So both of these organizations um, require sustainable management plans for forests so that there is no clear cutting going on, uh, minimal use of pesticides, making sure that uh, the biodiversity of a forest and old growth trees are conserved that endangered species and water quality are protected. Um, if you have um, uh, woods grown in tropical rainforests, that indigenous people's rights are, are respected, that non-genetically modified trees are, are used. So um, there's a whole host of criteria that um, the wood or paper products are um, assessed. But um, yeah, next time you even go to the grocery store, you can make a difference with your dollar there just by checking the bottom of your tissue box uh, or paper towels, and you will see um, these labels on those products. Um, next, 
is um, another what we call single attribute um, label. Uh, so this one is called Green Guard. Green Guard is it's single attribute label because similar to Energy Star, it's only focused on one attribute, and that's indoor air quality. We spend the majority, as much as we may love the outdoors, we spend the majority of our time indoors. So we want to make sure that we're using um, products in our in our homes and our offices um, that are low emitting. Um, and have uh, less volatile organic compounds or VOCs that can cause some health effects. Um, so uh, this particular logo is managed by Underwriters Laboratory of which uh, many of you may be familiar with UL, um, but Green Guard can be found on a wide variety of products ranging, ranging from furniture to carpet, uh, cleaning products, and even electronic equipment because um, printers actually do um, produce some VOCs as they're printing as well. Um, I even uh, sleep right now with a pillow that's Green Guard certified so it doesn't off gas that um, foamy scent that some of those um, foam pillows and foam mattresses have. Um, so this is a very legitimate label. Um, Green Seal has been around for many, many years. And this one, contrary to the other labels that we've been talking about, um, is multi-attribute. So it assesses um, a wide variety of health and environmental impacts. Uh, Green Seal, to me, um, first came out many years ago as more of a label for cleaning supplies. Um, but now you'll see it um, also uh, frequently on paper products and also paints, coatings, sealants, adhesives, and again, a very legitimate green um, label. Um, there is greenwashing out there. So um, Mark had that really great slide up with all those um, logos that are legitimate uh, eco labels. And that's a, that's a great resource, um, his, his particular slide that showed all of those uh, labels. And um, finally, the another e um, multi-attribute certification is called Eco Logo, which is also similar to Green Guard managed by uh, UL or Underwriters Laboratory. And you'll find Eco Logo on uh, building and construction materials, cleaning supplies, office equipment, paper, and plastic. Um, and it, man it um, assesses products through that um, supply chain that uh, Mark was mentioning earlier. So throughout its life cycle from where uh, materials are extracted to the manufacturing plants and how efficient they are, and then um, uh, how long does the product last uh, in use, and then where does it go at the end of its life cycle, life cycle assessment. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on a, a program that I manage here at DEP to help local governments in leading by example. So um, the 2018 Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan, um, this is the cover page of it. We are actually working on releasing our 2021 Pennsylvania Climate Action Plan uh, for release in September. But um, this is our current plan. And um, the plan outlines um, 19 different greenhouse gas reduction strategies for state and local government leaders to use. And uh, many of these aren't going to be a secret to you, you know, energy efficiency, sustainable transportation, clean, renewable energy, emergency preparedness, stormwater best management practices. But I have uh, number 18 um, highlighted um, because it's lead by example in Commonwealth um, and local government practices and assets. So we sort of took that strategy and we said, what can we do to support local governments in leading by example? Obviously, Mark touched on all the ways that GreenGov is supporting the state in leading by example, but how can we support uh, local governments besides the CoStar's green contracts? Um, so we created this LCAP, it's called, Local Climate Action Program, whereby we use U.S. Department of Energy funding that my office receives each year to pay a contractor called ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, to train college student and local government teams, that the students are matched up with a local government, 
to develop greenhouse gas inventories during the fall semester and uh, climate action plans during the spring semester. So it is an 11 month long program. Uh, it involves um, live training webinars and one on one technical assistance as well throughout the course of the 11 months. And so far we've had 41 local governments participate. So we have 41 greenhouse gas inventories and drafts and some finalized climate action plans um, in these past two years of the program. This is a link to our webpage for LCAP. So um, we are about to enter um, our third year of the program um, in August 2021, but um, this is uh, the, the um, schedule that uh, the the LCAP participants just finished up on. Um, we'll be following the same exact timeline for the third year of the program. So starting in early August, we will have our first training webinar focused on greenhouse gas inventories. They'll continue through November. And then um, starting in December, you'll form what's called a climate action task force at your local government to help move through the climate action planning process that starts in January and goes through June. And the ultimate goal of the program is a draft climate action plan in those 11 months. Um, so here is an example of what a greenhouse gas inventory looks like. If you haven't seen one before, Belfont Borough was one of our inaugural year participants and one of our shining star communities that participated. I'm actually presenting with them to the Pennsylvania State Mayor's Association later this week. Um, but you can see the majority of their greenhouse gas emissions are from residential buildings, then commercial buildings, and finally transportation. So those are the sectors that they really want to focus in on in their climate action plan, which is exactly what they did. Um, and this is the cover page of the climate action plan template that we provide to all participants in LCAP. Uh, it's a little bit like a plug and chug document where you enter the results of your greenhouse gas inventory, the results of a high level vulnerability assessment that you conduct, and then you choose your greenhouse gas reduction strategies um, throughout the document. And your, your student helps you to fill this out. You work as a team. Um, and you can tweak this document however you look, some however you like. Some um, local governments have really gone for the gusto. Cumberland County just submitted a 200 page climate action plan to us and the, the template is really only about 60 some pages. So um, you can go for the gusto or just really use the template, but we wanted to give you something so you didn't have to start from scratch. And an FIQ that we get is, you know, who are these leading communities that have participated? And I'd love to give them credit. These are our inaugural year participants. We had uh, boroughs, townships, cities, and counties participate from all across the state, from all corners, Northeast, South Central, uh, Northwest. Um, and then um, the a cohort that just finished up in June. Um, we had a lot of cities participate and in, in this particular cohort, including our, our state capital, which was great. Uh, Connect is the Congress of Neighboring Communities, which is um, about uh, 35 contiguous municipalities surrounding and including the city of Pittsburgh. So that's a regional entity that has participated. Um, and then um, I did just want to mention that, you know, the LCAP program isn't truly successful until you get to that CAP implementation stage where you're implementing your climate action plan. There's actions and strategies outlined in there. So we want to continue supporting the communities that participate in this intensive 11 month long training program. And we provide the, this kind of follow up assistance. We'll, we'll continue, we could either continue giving you a, um, free, it's actually a free ICLE membership using our US Department of Energy funds. So you continue getting some technical support from ICLE to implement your actions from your CAP. Um, we can assign some uh, capstone students to support you in implementing one of your strategies over the course of one semester, or we could um, provide you a part-time shared energy manager that would come and help you um, do focus on how to reduce your energy use. Um, in your community uh, via energy audits, um, a, fleet, a vehicle fleet analysis, um, uh, 
Mark mentioned about the, the verification for Energy Star for your buildings um, or energy management plans for operating your buildings as well. Um, so here is our recruitment timeline for um, LCAP year three. Um, if you are interested in participating, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact info will be at the end of this presentation and Felicia and Kim will also share it with you afterwards. Um, please reach out to me ASAP. This is the link to the application form to fill out. Um, I'm glad to have a call with you and answer any questions you have. I am actually gonna start doing my student matching with local governments next week. We do have a few spots available. So if you are interested, please reach out because our first training war webinar starts in early August, um, about three weeks from now. So, um, and here is my contact information if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I'll hand it back over to Kim, I believe. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, let me share my screen now. Move that. You see that, Felicia? Yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't find my uh, mute button. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm like, uh oh, am I muted? <laughs> okay, and thank you, Heidi and Mark. Um, that was some really great information about going green, and I know I've learned a lot. Um, and I'd like to um, go into uh, some contracts that our CoStars members have access to that can help them strive for greener procurement. Under our CoStars exclusive contracts, we offer green products under uh, CoStars 5 janitorial supplies, CoStars 8, our MRO contract, CoStars 26, passenger vehicles, CoStars 28, energy conservation management supplies, CoStars 29, groundskeeping services and supplies, CoStars 30, energy consulting services, CoStars 33, street light street lighting, parking meters, and street furniture, and CoStars 41, stormwater management products and services. And under CoStars participating statewide contracts, we also offer green products under the carpeting and resilient flooring contract, dilution control, dishwashing chemicals, fleet card services. Um, there are alternative fuels available under that contract, fuels, truck, transport, delivery, green eco-friendly vehicles contract, the MRO contract, supplies manufactured and services performed by persons with disabilities, the janitorial supplies under that contract, uh, various fuels, tank wagon delivery, and the new electric vehicle charging stations ITQ. And we will send um, you these contract numbers in our post event email for your reference. We're going to focus on searching statewide CoStars participating green contracts because eMarketplace offers uh, robust green search capabilities. So to search statewide contracts, you're going to go to our um, CoStars homepage, www.dgs.pa.gov forward slash CoStars and select the member information button and then select the members area button. And that'll bring you to the CoStars members area. Uh, on the left side navigation panel, you'll hover over search contracts and then select statewide contracts. And this is going to take you to eMarketplace. In the search by field, uh, you'll select green contracts. And from here, uh, we then have certification choices that you can search by. And we just heard about a lot of these certifications from Mark and Heidi today. But in the future, if you forget what they mean, DGS has information on the certifications on their green procurement page. And we will share the link to these certification definitions in our post event email as well. So let's. Uh, search by green guard certification since all the certifications were pre-selected um, we just deselect the ones that we don't want to search by 
and leave green guard selected and then select search. As you can see, two contracts appear, the MRO contract and the CAD workstation devices options and services contract. As a CoStars member, you always wanna pay attention to the CoStars column to make sure the supplier you're interested in working with is CoStars participating. Members cannot purchase from suppliers who have not opted to participate in the program. So you'll see a yes in that CoStars column if they are participating. To view supplier information and product offerings, you can open the contract overview, overview by selecting the blue O under uh, overview change notice column. And once you've selected your supplier, you'll want to direct any specific product questions to the supplier for more information on their green offerings. Because a supplier's contract offerings may include varied uh, green certifications, all products may not be certified. The supplier will be able to walk you through on the individual products that they offer. If your organization is not currently a CoStars member, uh, we would like to share some resources to help you learn more about the program and how to become a CoStars member. So um, to do that, you'll return to the CoStars homepage. That's www.dgs.pa.gov forward slash CoStars. And by selecting the member information button, you'll find more detailed program information as well as the process to become a member. You may also view one of our previous member webinars on program benefits. So you'll select the program resources button. In the event calendar, you can click on the title of February's webinar to learn uh, how more about the CoStars program, how it benefits members, and also to view a contract search demonstration. If you cannot find um, the answer to a question in the many resources available to you on the CoStars website, the CoStars team is always here to help. Um, the contact info we have listed here will connect you to the CoStars team. So if an individual you're trying to reach is not available, others will be aware that you've reached out and they can help you. And we realize that we've covered a ton of information today about going green. Um, and we're gonna open the chat now if you have any questions. Uh, we'd be happy to take your questions for Heidi, Mark, or uh, Felicia and I. And we're also going to add a survey link in the chat. We'd appreciate if you quickly um, take the survey just to let us know um, what you think about this webinar so we can um, use that information to improve future webinars. So we'll open that up for chat now. I just want to say to Heidi that I checked my box of tissues and there is nary a certification on it. So I need to change my tissue purchasing habits. <laughs> shame, shame, shame. I'm, I'm glad you checked, Felicia. That's 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 the first step. <laughs> No, I even, go even, like, even even like the Wegmans brand, um, the generic Wegmans brand is uh, um, uh, I think they're SFI certified. So yeah. You can find them. <laughs> I was looking everywhere on the box thinking, come on, you've got to be something. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Felicia, were you going to add the um, survey link? Oh, yes, I will add the oh, survey link. Thank you. You're welcome. Any I'm questions? You reminded me. <laughs> no problem. Yes, you were too busy checking your tissue box. <laughs> I was. <laughs> <laughs> the survey link is now in the chat. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it doesn't look like we have any questions for today. So we do want to remind you that you'll be getting a, a post-event email in the next few days um, with uh, the contract numbers, um, some information from the speakers, um, and talking about um, certification meetings so that you can refer back to that. Um, 
Excuse me. And uh, we will also send you the link to the recording once that's um, available. So if you wanted to refer back to that for any particular piece of information, you will have access to it. I guess we have no questions. So we'll yes. thank you everyone for attending. And have yes, a great day. Yep. And thank you, Mark and Heidi. <laughs> thank you yeah, very thanks much for the invite. And yeah, we um. We we're so efficient. We got done in the hour too. So. Yeah, we did. I was noticing that. I was like, look at us go. <laughs> yep. Thanks for the invite. Um, You're welcome. Thanks thank for Thank you us. for taking the time. All right. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Sure Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Take care. You too.